Let me introduce you, Maurice Mitchell, who is the chairman, director, president, what you want to call it, of national director of the Working Families Party. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. well, you know, um, the last time we spoke actually was before the pandemic. Yes. And, um, you know, things were, there's a particular, there's a particular talk that you gave about if, don't tell me that there isn't, uh, that, that you want to be non-ideological because being non I, I, I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. Being non-ideological is, in effect, ideological. Absolutely. Expand on that for me. Okay, well, we're going, we're going right we're into going it. Right into it. <laughs> I mean, I think there, in our discourse, there's... This, and I'm sorry, Maurice. Okay, no problem. Yeah. So in our discourse, in like the popular discourse, in a lot of like the mainstream discourse, there is this illusion that you can be non-ideological. Right. Right? And oftentimes, when people speak... Um, derisively right. of ideologues. Right. Like they're often talking about people on the left, actually, right. especially inside of the Democratic Party right. when, when they're debating ideology. Right. And I think that that is outrageous right. for a number of reasons. Number one, it is assuming that the people, like, let's just take the Democratic Party, then I'm right. going to go broadly. Right. But inside the Democratic Party, when you hear these debates, it assume, it's making this assumption that people that are called quote unquote centrist, and right. I hate that term, yeah. right? Um, that they don't have ideology, right? Right? That they're they're sort of like blank slates ideo uh, ideologically, right. when they're advancing a very particular ideological worldview exactly. of incrementalism, of neoliberalism, this idea that the markets can take can kind of handle all the issues that we right. face, even even these big existential issues that we face that is a particular philosophy and a particular ideology that is informing public policy informing debate so we should name it we should surface it and we should have that philosophical debate instead of denying the debate by claiming that there is an ideology and there's a reason for that because they they have succeeded in having their ideology be the common sense. Right. Right? So you don't have to really like surface it when it's just in the air. Right. Which is why it's so important for those of us that have issues with it, for those of us that believe that there's huge fallacies and there's more of us than them, right? right. Most By people far, yeah. most people believe like hey, this stuff isn't working. Right. We may not have the ideological terminology in place. Right. Most of us are like the system isn't working. Um, big business doesn't work for us. Uh, politics are corrupt. Wealthy people and corporations have more power and influence that, that, than they need. Well, there's actually an ideology that puts that in place. Right. Right. And we want to have that conversation and they don't want to have that conversation. They're scared of the conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is why. We even have this fallacy that there's such a thing as being non-ideological, right. right? Or that there are this both sidism. Right. Right. Oh, I hate that. The yes. both sidism that there's like a far right and a far left, and there's problems in both of these extremes, and we need to meet each other in the middle. Right. Right. When what I always like to say is like, look, the right and the left are not equal. Right. <laughs> right. You have a right and you have a far right that is violent, right. that is authoritarian, right. that is anti-democratic, then in some, some forms of the far right are fascistic. Right. And as much as I could see, the, the worst thing you could say about the left or like the far left is that, yeah, um, sometimes people on the left could be really annoying, yes. right? Yeah. And unless there's a way that you could weaponize being annoying and people could be annoyed to death, right. we should not be both siding these things, right. right? When people on the far right are actually organizing in militias, are storming the Capitol, are trying to use public policy in order to prevent democracy from existing, right. we need everybody people who identify as progressive, people who identify as centrist, people who identify as conservative, recognizing that there is a particular strand of right-wing ideology that seeks to destroy all other ideas. Right. And we cannot tolerate that, right. right? And so we could only have that conversation if we're explicit about the fact that Everything in public life is, an, is part of an ideological right. what, project. What your belief system is. Yes, it's your belief system. And like, you know, the, the term ideology might be confusing for folks. It's just like your belief system. Right. It's just the thing that you use to understand where we are and where, you, where we want to go. Everybody has one of those. Right. Some of them are more coherent than others. Some of them are more, more 
consistent and and um, clear than others, but we all have them. And if you think you don't have them, then likely you're replicating the dominant status quo worldview. Because you don't really have to talk about having an ideology because the system is you. Yes. So if if you think you don't have one, then the things that you're doing are likely exactly. replicating the status quo. And what the status quo says is the systems that are in place, the racial and class hierarchies that are in place, uh, the inequality that's in place, right. those things are fine. Right. And we want to lock them in place. Right. And so by carrying on in a non-ideological way, not being curious about your grounding philosophy, you are putting in place and reaffirming that thing. And you should be aware of that. You shouldn't think that what you're doing is neutral. Right. And that's why I, I said that when I said that and why I think it's so important. I actually wrote about this. Right. Um, we need to be clear about who we are ideologically as organizations and as individuals. And I actually believe that the more ideological we are, like the more clear we are about our grounding philosophy, right. the, the, the better it is in society because then I could say like, oh, this is where you are. Right. This is where, where I am. This is where we could collaborate. This is where we have differences. Mm -hmm. But when everything's all mushy, it's really hard to do that. And that is actually by the design of the people you know, at the top of the hierarchy. Mushiness is increased in entropy and, and all of that is what is needed. In fact, profit is made on people not knowing stuff. That's why we don't have Medicare for all and all of that. The, 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 the issues that you have when there's so many choices to not real choices. Right, but, not real choices. But that's what occurs. Now, I, I said I wanted to talk something about it and a lot of people would not really tie these together. First sure. of all, we know that the working uh, families uh, organization, I mean, the working family party, party yeah. I always mess up. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Sure. That, that We know what uh, that it stands for, livable wages and all the good things that uh, yeah. progressives know most Americans want. 60, 70, 80% of Americans. Yes, yes. Something is happening now with called AI. Yes. AI is going to affect, at for once now, the class that thought they were unaffectable, if mm -hmm. that's a word, mm -hmm. are suddenly going to be affected because writers are going to be replaced and mm -hmm. all of these are going to replace them. Now, people are scared. Yeah. I am not scared. I'm, in, I'm saying we can embrace AI if we had it done in a format that's honest. In other words, AI is nothing more than productivity increases. Mm -hmm. If productivity increases is simply for the wealthy, then it's a problem because, yeah, not only the working class loses jobs, but now the regular folks lose jobs. However, if we have policies now that says, by the way, AI was the composite knowledge of us all. Mm -hmm. And as a composite knowledge of us all, yeah. we should all partake in that, it, that you don't need 50 operators, you only need 10 operators now. Well, we probably need to reduce the work week by 50% or, or mm -hmm, 60%. Mm -hmm. If we look at AI as the composite knowledge and meaning we need to work less, it would work. But in a capitalist system as we oh, have it yeah. today, <laughs> yeah. so, the yeah. spoils are going to go yeah. you know work. This yeah. question comes. Yeah, okay, let me hear the question. Coming. Okay. The question is coming. How is the working families, parties, and others, instead of fighting AI like I've seen in the unions in, in Hollywood, etc., use AI as a matter of saying, no, what it means mm -hmm. is this composite knowledge, the productivity from this composite knowledge needs to be shared. There are two ways to skin a cat. Okay. Stop it yep. or... So let me let me reframe that a little bit, yes. right? So I don't think there's any real s stopping of technology. No way, right? yes. Technology is a tool, right? right? The thing that I'm curious about is who's wielding that, that tool, Power, yes. right? The other, the other questions I'm, I'm curious about is that who is realizing the upside from yes. engaging that tool? And if there is a downside, who has to hold the downside? Right. It is a system question, right? right? If, if the people who are wielding that tool are people who are already privileged, people like Silicon Valley VCs and others, yes. And if they are also the people who will realize the upside, yeah. and then the downsides will be will be held by all of us, mm -hmm. then number one, that's called capitalism. Yes. And I think we're on the road for AI to do that. Not because it's AI, but because we're it's we're living under system. this economic system. Right. Right? Right. Now, so the question is, how can our organizing 
leverage this moment. Right. When workers are realizing their power. Right. When actors are going on strike, writers are going on strike, um, you know, UPS drivers are going on strike. Um, how can we how can we take this moment where where AI and automation and robotics are sort of reimagining work? How can we use that as a as an occasion to lead, right? And so what I'm interested in, what is going to be the social justice application mm -hmm. of this technology, right? And then also, what are, the, what are the systems applications? How can we perhaps have a different economic system, right? Where, all right, if this technology, right, is creating more productivity and creating more value, right. how can we realize the value? Because when you look at all of these technologies, right. From automation to AI to exactly. right, they're leveraging the commons. Hey, that's my right? point. So they're yes. leveraging the commons. They're leveraging what is our common value, right? For example, AI is just like the pulling in knowledge from the everybody. Yes, yes, from the internet, just knowledge from everybody. Things right. that maybe you wrote, exactly. things that I wrote, right? right? Just sucking it up and making a, a, a model out of that. Right. But then a, a handful of white men in Silicon Valley are going to be the ones that benefit from the total knowledge of the... So how can we have public policy in place, right, that says, if we're going to, if we're going to realize these benefits, perhaps, mm -hmm. from automation, from uh, the attention economy and, right. and these algorithms, from AI, all of these tools, how can the public policy be, be put in place to ensure that the, the wealth and the capacity that is derived from these things benefit the commons that actually built these things. And a lot of these things, like a lot of these, like for example, like Elon and Tesla, right? They didn't like do anything, yeah. But, but you know, te like, what, like, like first of all, Elon didn't start Tesla, right? right? But yeah. <laughs> that's a whole other thing. Yeah. But Tesla benefited from a huge government Government grant, contracts. Government contracts, right? That's one of the reasons why Tesla's Tesla, right? Yeah. And then like, so many things we, we overlook as part of the commons, like the interstate highways, the internet, the infrastructure right. of the internet, um, a lot of the research and development coming out of our public in, uh, institutions, our public universities, right? So the public is creating this infrastructure and the groundwork for these businesses and for these VC people to be able to even benefit, right? And, and there's the public knowledge on the internet was yes. created by us. There should be public policy put in place, and it can't just be U.S. because this technology is everywhere. Everywhere, right. global public policy put in place to ensure that we, as humanity, can actually benefit from the from the capacity that's being built from these technologies, and that is on us and our organizing. And we need to to constrain these corporations to hold them accountable to make that happen. I am glad you said that, and I, because one of the things that I, I've been putting AI into the productivity domain and the and the commons, you know, because that that's where it comes from. But if you if you watch the news and watch most of the organizations that get play, we don't hear that message, which is something that I think is important. And I think it is on us, it's on progressives to change the narrative because the AI narrative is not what you just said, which it is. And to put it bluntly, AI is just one technology. But from the building of the cars where all this money goes to a few, to every technology that we've had, it has always been the technology of the commons. Mm -hmm. It has all to everything that you see here technological. Yeah. Uh, even when Intel built the processor, it wasn't on just Intel, but it was on the person who understood materials. It was on the person who understood all these things. And I'm glad that you're putting it that way. My next question is sure. how, how do we nationalize, internationalize the message beyond what the mainstream media will do. And you say, I have the answer. I want to see if you, what you are going to say okay. about that. So, so you have the answer? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm curious what your answer is. But, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a broken record, right? Yes. So ultimately, I think through our, through our organizing, right, right we, we need to have a popular conversation right. about these basic facts. You, right. you started off with ideology, right? right? We're, we're often kind of confused about these things, right? right? So even though, even though all of the value of an economy comes from us, so. us just right. like regular people right. doing what we do, and, and how do I know that? 
Well, if one day every single uh, fund manager mm -hmm. um, died, <laughs> died. Let's let's get no, out no, there. right. Yes. Our our economy, our way of life will go on in perpetuity. Yes, if that happened tomorrow. Right. And the reason why we know this for sure is because we all experienced COVID. Right. We all experienced that. Yes. And then the paradigm that somehow placed these titans of capital on top and all of us right. on the bottom, they got flipped. Exactly. And everybody rep understood yes. the value of the, the, what do they call the quote unquote frontline workers. Yes. Right. All of those, all of that frontline work yes. is the actual work that perpetuates our economy every single day. Right. You know, from food delivery people to nurses, right. to doctors and orderlies, to sanitation workers, right. to the working class, right? Those folks, we're not really sure what they do or what value they actually bring into the economy. And they're like, you know, either like the people who are like developing more and more Baroque sort of financial products that are based on other financial products that are based on other financial products. Right. But the person that's actually like, like, yes, like it's so abstract, yes. right? Yes. Um, that it's really even hard to understand what's being bought and sold and everything else. Right. Like at the end of the day, we weren't concerned with them and making sure that they could work every single day. We were concerned with how can how can the food delivery person, how can the people in uh, working, working behind cash registers and groceries, how can nurses, how could. Right. So the point I'm making here is that we need to have a proper a proper frame, mm -hmm. a proper ideological frame right. to have this conversation. If we are the ones that are constantly the people who produce the value in this economy, then it's only natural that that we should receive the the benefit from the value that we put in. How are we putting in all the inputs, but some folks who actually aren't... In, that don't even know how to do it. Right. How are they the ones that are... So with this question around technology, AI, robotics, you know, on and on and on and on, to me... The fundamental problem is the economic system. And once we realize that, then we will organize. Right. And we will we will organize. And I think the biggest, the one thing currently, as long as we have a oligarchic form of democracy that we could, right, we could use that in order to, this is what we do at Working Families. Right. We believe that working people should govern, not the wealthy, not corporations. We should use the limited purchase we have on democracy to commandeer government, exactly right, so that we could create public policy in order to constrain capital, so that we could ensure that we realize the value. Uh, everyday people realize the value of our economy. What does that look like, right? A, a robust public health care system, including mental health, a robust top class educational system from K to university, right. Ro the commons, parks and libraries, and like. We we are the wealthiest country in the history of countries, right. right? And so there's enough wealth for all of us to experience that. It's the public policy because we have a corporately captured um, uh, corporately captured government. It's the public policy that is so skewed to those to those VC people in Silicon Valley and the already wealthy and the corporations. And the one thing that we have is our ability to to be able to to seize control of the government and then create public policy, policy in order to constrain those folks. And we should use that. Also, as workers, we should use our ability as workers to organize together and be able to, that thing that I talk about, the inputs that we're putting into our economy, our labor, exactly. organize our labor in order to demand from the corporate class and from the wealthy the conditions that we want, And which is why I'm so excited that that the Teamsters are, look like they might strike. On UPS. Right. Yes. On UPS, that that actors are on the verge of striking, that writers are striking, working people are recognizing the power, recognizing, oh, I have something, I have my labor, this thing that's so valuable that, yeah. that the ruling class takes for granted. If we organize together, Maurice, we can change the, the conditions. We are excited about this, we're excited yeah. to have you. You have another appointment, All right. and I don't want to break the promise. So thank you so much. It was so good, brother. It's been, been too long. Here. Absolutely. So thank you for being on Politics Done and Right, my man. Absolutely. And can I just make a shout out? Absolutely. If, do if it. anybody's interested in organizing with us at the Working Families Party, uh, the best thing you could do is you could either text WFP to three zero four zero three or find us at Working Families on 
on Twitter, on Instagram, on all the social media, or go to our website, workingfamilies.org. Thank you so kindly. Thank it's you, been brother. a pleasure every time. Absolutely. And we must do this again sooner Let's than do it. the last time. Okay? All right, take care. All right, take care now. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. Today, we are honored once again to have with us the one and only Dr. Andy Bard. Who's Dr. Andy Bard? Of course, a prize-winning author, former Democratic candidate for Congress in Virginia's uh, very, very red Shenandoah Valley, former talk show host, summa cum laude, graduate from Harvard, so we know he's smart, uh, awarded with distinction in a program specifically created to accommodate his original theory explaining how civilization has developed and a frequent columnist in newspapers throughout the United States, Mr. Dr. Schmuckler. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing fine. Glad to be back with you. Well, absolutely. So we today we're going to discuss an article some may think they have a notion of, because even I told you the article is titled, How Are We to Think of Human Nature? To which I responded, Nurture versus Nature. And then you said, Let's take it a little bit deeper. So, Dr. Schmuckler, tell me about human nature. Well, should I start with those two uh, straw men that I, or should I go right to my thesis, you know? My brother, it's okay. on Okay, all right. So you, 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 you mentioned that I have this uh, uh, original theory about uh, what's happened to us as a species since we uh, became civilized and took an unprecedented step. Well, that uh, that's true, and it it has had a um, at, at the center of it has been the question of human nature. So I got hit by that idea in 1970. I went in to see what everybody was saying about human nature because that was at the center of my vision, and I found that uh, I, I really didn't agree with uh, some of uh, the, the main things that are out there in our civilization. One was the uh, the idea that we didn't have a, a, a real human nature, that we are so plastic that uh, culture can make of us anything it wants, and uh, um, like that. And I rejected that because we evolved to be creatures who lived like primates and then uh, uh, hominids and then... Uh, uh, hunter-gatherer bands of homo sapiens for hundreds of thousands of years. We had to have a nature then. How could we not have one now just because we're cultural? Because hunter-gatherers were living in a way that was consistent with uh, with what we had done before. And all creatures have to have an inborn uh, Doctor, nature. let me stop you for yeah. a second here because a lot of folks uh, that are listening won't necessarily understand what you mean by we were hunter-gatherers. So why don't you give us a little, a, a slight explanation oh. of what that means? Oh, well, interesting. Um, you know, I, that's been so fundamental to how I think. I, I, I forget that not everybody's thought that way. But until 10,000 years ago, all of Homo sapiens, our species, were living as what's called hunter-gatherers, which is they live off of what nature spontaneously provides as opposed uh, to well as opposed to what then came we started inventing a new way of life and that begins with the domestication of plants and animals the the animals that people used to hunt they start to gather into pens and the the plants that the the gatherers used to gather uh people start to cultivate in their uh, own farm. gardens and and this is an enormously significant event in the history of life. I mean, three and a half billion years, never had a species done what we did then, which is invent a new way of life. And so 
It's a gradual emergence. Of course we had a nature and why would it go away? Well, you can say, well, for 10,000 years, we've been doing something different from what we'd always done, but that's, that's just a drop in the bucket, you know, um, 10,000 years after, uh, you know, mammalian evolution for a hundred million years or how, how that's the dryer. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, anyway, it was obvious that we would still have a, a, a substantial and important human nature, which equipped us to be able to do what we had to do when we lived in that other circumstance that we emerged out of over tens or hundreds of millions of years, however you want to think of it. And then there are the other people who would look at human nature and they would say, we're territorial animals. We're, 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 we're inherently willing to use violence to get what we want. And, and you can notice whenever anybody in our culture says, well, that's human nature. I think virtually without exception, when somebody says, well, that's human nature, they're pointing to something negative. So the heart of my vision about what's happened to us as a species could be boiled down to the statement that we've discussed before, that the ugliness we see in human history is not a clear window into our human nature. So I disagreed with the people who said we had no nature, and I disagreed with the people who said that we should look at our nature as basically problematic. And, you know, it's interesting because I think that can be expanded into a lot of different arenas. Right now, we're talking about civilization, human nature, and what is it intrinsic to us that um, that makes us do what we do. But many a times when we're talking about just regular policies that we that we come up with, a lot of the excuses generally made on the right is that sounds good. That sounds like something nice to do, but it's not what, again, Dr. Schmuckler, it's not human nature, and therefore we don't do. Continue, and, please. And, and kind of expand one of on the that. places where you and I have uh, have joined, I believe, and why... Um, I appreciate your having me back uh, to deliver my better human story, but I think I understand that part of the appeal of a better human story for you is that you have a vision that we are capable of making a society that is far better than what we've got now. Absolutely. And so, and, and so it, it's a value from your point of view, as it is from mine, to be able to see that what we are seeing around us shouldn't be understood as a clear window into this is what we are. We could be a lot better. And, and so the, the heart of this piece to, to move into the next phase is to answer the question, well, if I'm right in my uh, vision, which we're not getting into today, but have in the past, which says that any species that steps across the line into, into civilization is going to uh, get swept up into a systemic force that unnaturally drives the civilization to develop in destructive ways. And I feel like I proved that, uh, but that's not where we're going now. Where we're going now is assuming that a, such a systemic force has driven uh, the, evol the development of civilization in, in, in ways that we could not avoid but, and did not choose. Assuming that, how are we to understand what we're seeing in relation to well, what is our nature? And that leads me to tell the story about some research from the 1950s involving uh, before you go into monkeys. the research because yeah. that was a good research the one that you talk about the monkeys that were that had two different ways of uh, being raised i i enjoyed that story but i want to before we get to the research itself move it a bit more into today's reality because um uh how it is that we america as a country many a times had found itself on a path to redemption and on a path to correct its past ills on a path that says uh we are we are better than that how do we then uh if 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 there isn't 
something within ourselves that want to be quote unquote bad and you know i'm just using that as yeah, a that, as that's an fine. excuse that's fine. how do we allow using your terminology again the uh the gangster how do we allow the gangster to move us back into a position that really is rather inhumane and what we would like to call not human nature but societal maybe well so if somebody's willing to grant me that there's a force that's not a function of human nature that has driven uh our uh, our civilization considered as a whole system that's been you know globally developing for 10,000 years and you know takes the forms of individual societies and cultures and it takes the form of the whole pattern in which uh, empires get built uh, um, by powerful societies incorporating weaker societies if you're willing to um, just sort of stipulate for the moment that you step across the, the, this threshold into civilization and boom, you're in this war of all against all and all kinds of crap's gonna happen no matter what the nature of, this, of the, the creature. If you stipulate that, then you're gonna say, well, look at, and we've discussed this too, how patterns of brokenness uh, um, move through history, move through time. You've got, and, and part of the thing is that you've got, you know, people who are broken in various ways. They've been raised uh, in, in family structures that are injurious, um, that are the fruit of all that crap that's been going on. So for example, I, I'm writing a piece right now about what is it that makes people susceptible to believing lies? Because, you know, as a guy, I've been a truth teller. I mean, it's, I'm all about finding the truth and telling the truth. And, and I'm just blown away by what I've witnessed. Um, we've got tens of millions of people in this country who believe, and I, we could make a little list of really important beliefs that they believe to be true and whose, whose falsehood is just couldn't be more obvious. You know, the stolen election lie, uh, the Trump did nothing wrong lie, the climate change is a hoax lie. I mean, there's no way anybody with basic intelligence and who is reasonably open to, to information would know, there's no way not to know that those are lies. I mean, how can you not know that the election wa wasn't stolen from Trump, that he was the one. I mean, it's just it's it's just out there it presented as as boldly as anything I've ever seen presented on, on, on the public stage. How can you not know that climate change is a major thing? I mean, just the, the daily news practically with wildfires and all the rest. You know, how can you not know? Well, if you look into the answer to how it is that people can get not, you, you find that there are systemic forces that are breaking them. And you what are they? See, well, well, for example, it can be a cultural thing. First of all, you can be brought up in a family in which there are lies that you're the children are compelled to, to believe. You know, nobody's allowed to know that daddy is uh, molesting his daughter. Or nobody's allowed to know that um, uh, uh, the daddy's a, an alcoholic. Uh, whatever the family secrets are, you can be brought up being compelled to believe a lie. That's the brokenness in that family. And you could ask, well, how did he get to be that kind of a guy? That also is going to be a product of history. And then there's cultural things. Like I live, I live in Dixie, as, as do you by the way. Uh, I live in, in the land of the Confederacy, and it is a land in which lies have been told. Uh, uh, there's, there, if you look into the history of how the Civil War was taught in the South, you find that the powers of the state were used to compel teachers to teach lies about the Civil War. So people people grew up 
and and it goes back before the Civil War too. But the, just looking at the 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 loss cause lie, the war of northern aggression lie, the the uh, states' rights lie. It, it it was it emerged right after the Civil War. It was it's been sold to generations of of um, uh, Southerners who have made a hero of Jefferson Davis, who led his region into an utter disaster. It's saturated with lies, and people are brought up from the beginning in the culture to be able to absorb certain kinds of lies lies from certain kinds of authorities. Anyway, the world is broken. People, ma it, it makes people broken. Then broken people forward the force of brokenness and make the, so we are dealing with 10,000 years of a force of brokenness working in countless ways, permeating every level from the individual psyche to family structure, to, to social structure, to power structures, to the international system. Now, everything that you've just said there, if you, if you take a listen to it, uh, back to um, the, the article that we're discussing here with regards to human nature, I think a lot of what you're saying is, uh, and, 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 and I think the, your, your experiment as well that you're about to talk about is going to prove that, and I think it's something that I've always agreed with, that while there is, in fact, human nature, much of what occurs has less to do with human nature, because all the brokenness that you talk about, all these issues that you speak about with people wanting to believe fallacies or people having learned fallacies from their inception, from their birth, actually says that a lot of this quote unquote brokenness, a lot of this belief system, it's the external that's causing it and not the nature that's causing it. Do I, yeah, do I read you right? Yeah, the, we live in an unnatural world. Right. Um, which is not, it's, it's partly to be understood as this is what people wanted, you know, like, uh, you know, I, I've got a soft chair over there, you know, uh, that, that's what I wanted. I got hot and cold running water over there that that's what i wanted part of it is people meeting their needs but part of it is this other systemic force driving things in ways that nobody has been in a position to control and, and so um i think that people don't often think about how the whole can be something other than the sum of its parts mm -hmm. Uh, they think that if human beings have been acting for 10,000 years, then whatever comes out of it has got to be an expression of what human beings are. But that's not really, you know, that, that, that does not follow. I mean, it, it does not follow because people can plunge into an, a situation like we did that has a dynamic of its own. But and, I, I think if and, we expand on that, we just take a look at how far we've come with things like uh, changing the past belief on women rights, uh, the rights of uh, uh, gay marriage and all these things. When you think think about where we've been and how, where we've gone, I think that probably makes your case as well. Now, you have an experiment that you mentioned in the article yeah. that actually I think is probably one of the better experiments that tells, that just shows, uh, yes, there is human nature or there is nature, if you will, but again, externalities play a part. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, the, the, the point's going to be that for species like us, uh, we're born incomplete because for, and we're not the only ones, but we're the-, the what, do, what do you mean by we were born incomplete? Well, the, well uh, the, what I mean is we're born, for example, with the innate- capacity, which is quite extraordinary, uh, just us human beings, we're going to learn a language. But what language we're going to learn, that depends on where we get born, you know? It, you and I speak English, though so you're, you're bilingual in a way that I, I, I'm not. Um, but, you know, we, we could, we, if we'd been born in a different time and place, we could be speaking, you know, ancient Greek or we could be speaking uh, Mandarin Chinese, and that stands for all kinds of things. But even the rhesus monkey 
who's not going to be learning a language and a, a culture as complex as, as what hu we humans do. The study took a bunch of uh, rhesus monkey infants and divided them into two groups. One group, and, and each one was growing up separately with this phony mother. One group had a phony mother that consisted only of wire mesh. The other group had the same thing, except that it had a piece of terry cloth uh, uh, around, uh, around it, which turned out to be important because the rhesus monkey is born needing something to cuddle up to. And that's fine in all the situations that rhesus monkeys are born in, you know, probably, you know, virtually, they're going to have a mother who's there taking an interest in them and letting them cuddle up against them. So this, the, the nature of the child is there when it's born needing something to cuddle up with. But if it doesn't get that, like with the, 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 the group of infants that uh, get just the wire mesh, they develop into something really messed up. They are incapable of functioning in rhesus monkey society, and, and they're so, social animals. They're incapable of, of mating. They are completely messed up because they were born with a nature that required cultures, required the environment to provide something, to complete them properly. And except for the unnatural thing that the... Um, scientist who would never be allowed to do this experiment nowadays, the scientists create this unnatural situation, which resulted in messing up the, the creature so much that it, it, it could hardly, you know, that's not rhesus nature. What you see with those rhesus monkeys raised in those unnatural situations, we would never think that that's rhesus na nature. It's the other ones who managed, who had the terry cloth and who managed to develop into a fairly normal functioning uh, m adult monkeys. Right. That's rhesus nature. So that unnatural environment, the wire mesh mother, is at least somewhat analogous to the civilized societies that we human beings have been compelled to live in. They are unnatural in ways that are not a function of how to complete us. They have been in many ways hostile to human nature because the whole, and this is going back to, to the idea that we've gone into before, the, the necessity has been that what survives is what can prevail in a war of all against all. What survives is essentially the spirit of the warlord, which is what emerges out of the anarchy that the step into civilization inevitably creates. So we get the unnatural environment. I don't know how much of it you could say uh, that we have around us today, I think we're we're doing better than humanity generally has. How much of it is wire mesh mother that twists and breaks us? And how, but we do know that when civilization first emerged, fully bloomed in cities and empires, what we see is indeed the spirit of the gangster having a disproportionate say in how the human world gets run. We see we see tyrants. Uh, we see the majority of people living lives of slaves. This is not what human beings would have chosen. This is the unnatural environment. So here's a question, and and this is what uh, and and I, I it's one that I want answered. I think it's one that we seek the answer for over and over again. And I think if we find the right answer to this. We may be successful. In, do, you, do you think I'm going to be able to answer it? I well, I I think you should know the answer. Uh, okay. I don't know. Let's see. Uh, All right, but, but suck here, it to me. Here's the thing, Doc. Um, you know, my contention is that most people are are good, and I, 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 I see that. I work with that. I talk to people of all stripes, and I can tell you, deep in my heart, this is a, not a this is not a cliche. Most people are good and most actually want to do good. 
but also uh, what you talk about a lot, the externalities that come into people's minds, everything that you talk about, the spirit of the gangster, being able to control the people, all of that is what I see. I look at the gangsters in our society, and the gangsters aren't only the Donald Trumps. In fact, uh, Donald Trump himself has his own gangster, in my opinion, which is the system above him. But they are able, a small quantity of them are able to penetrate the good people. And I'm not only talking about what they learn, but it's just on how they act and the things that they do and what they consider normal. What do you think, first of all, is the proper way to define that? And secondly, how do we get to people to neutralize the bad gangster and become a good gangster? Well, I... I or, uh, just... Let me back up. Oh, okay. I, I said that wrong. How can we change from the bad gangster to make them see us as gangsters for good? Well, I, I, I wouldn't... I would never use a phrase like gangsters for good, but... Uh... <laughs> well, you, you get the analogy I'm trying to make. Well, yeah. So you say all uh, most people are good. Yes. Um, I see a lot of truth in that, but I I do have to confess that I uh, I've struggled for uh, over fifty years to get a clear idea of you know what is our human nature, and I, I really don't I don't know how good it is. I, I feel like I can prove that it's better than we we have been taught to think it is. And, and I, I, I'm aware of the, uh, a lot of research which indicates that things like compassion, um, uh, uh, empathy. A sense, a, a empathy, a sense of fairness do seem to be built into us. Um, but I, I also think that, um, you know, com the the fostering of uh, of human goodness um, is also a challenge. I mean, just like a, a, a culture um, uh, can work to make people um, broken, I think that real wholeness um, is an achievement, uh, not just a birthright. Um, I think that when people are just sort of naturally who they are, you, know, you can see the selfishness that there is in a, a toddler or something like that. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff in us and um, it's not all, um, uh, it, it's not all to create the world in which there is a peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Uh, I, I think that, you know, the teachings of our religions are uh, aspirations that would be challenging to meet, even if we didn't have to deal with these systemic forces of brokenness. So, but I don't know exactly where we where we'd end up if we didn't have systemic forces to work with. It would still, I think, uh, be a project to build a really whole world in which uh, people are really good to each other and, and people are, are able to achieve um, uh, their maximal fulfillment. That being said, it is important to realize, uh, and I think we, you said that in our next conversation, we're going to talk about a piece about the utter selfishness of three wreckage, major yeah, figures. The wreckage. Yeah, and, and, you know, the... the, the uh, incredible selfishness of three people who are playing um, a very impactful role in our world, especially Putin and Trump are the two. But I throw in uh, Israel's Netanyahu, who, whose selfishness uh, blows my mind. Uh, and, and and whose self and whose selfishness is uh, in the process of destroying his country. Um, so I, I threw that in. And, and and, and the question is that you raise, I would pose as, um, how do we create a world in which people who are so extraordinarily broken in that way aren't don't play such a disproportionate role in human affairs? I mean, Putin by himself has changed the whole dynamic of the planet, you know. 
the piece of Europe that took him you know, 70 some years to good to build. He, he, he's, he's broken it. Just one man made that decision. How do we create a world in which somebody like that cannot become the sole voice deciding what a nation with a massive nuclear arsenal will do on the planet? So that's, you know, one level of saying what the challenge is. And another level of it is, uh, you know, something's gone wrong in this country at the level of consciousness. If you've got a major American political party that would have the relationship with a would-be tyrant like Donald Trump that the base had in 2015-16 to make him the nominee, that the bit that the party has had to acquit him when he was the most impeachable president we could imagine, and that continues to follow him even after he's essentially tried to overthrow the democratic the constitutional order. He didn't create the circumstances in which such a thing could happen. How do we? heal what's gone wrong in the minds of tens of millions of people. And that's the question, how do we do it? Well, I, I often come up with a metaphor, um, it's not the great metaphor, but I often come up with it. Yeah, I don't, I don't buy meat, I don't cook meat, but my mom used to make a pot roast and she made a delicious pot roast. And I remember the way a good piece of chuck roast would be marbled with, uh, with with fat. So there's real meat and then there's the fat to bring out the flavor and uh, ideally. Well, in the, the, the world we live in is that chuck roast. And the fat is all the dimensions of brokenness that there are at every level of the society from people's uh, uh, being taught to, to uh, uh, hate the animal that we also are, uh, you know, all the things that happen in our in our world that are broken at every level, the injustices, the, the prejudices, the paranoias, you know, all of it needs to be dealt with. It's all a fun, it, it all feeds its, itself. So if you look at the force of fascism in America today, you can see the truth tributaries to them are all the dimensions of American brokenness that we've seen over the uh, the centuries. So then the do we race, fix it? The so racism, we... the, 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 the corporate greed, they're all aligned, sort of showing this is all, these are all the rivers that are, that, that, that are feeding in, that are now in a position to threaten the very survival of American democracy. And we've had all these rivers all along, but, um, but they have, they have uh, com combined in a way. Dr. Schmuckler, um, good problem uh, talking about the issue, et cetera. And we're running close on time here. So I'm going to ask you uh, one thing to um, to uh, when we talk about uh, the wickedness uh, that we we spoke about before. Uh, the the whatness. What I, I think we called it. Uh, uh, I I don't have your email right now. The next subject that we're talking about: wicked, oh, wrecked, the, the, or the the wreckage. Wreckage. The wreckage that utter what did I say? <laughs> reeks upon the world. Right. That's what I we like. I like reeking wreckage. Yeah. There, there we go. Yeah, I know you'd have some sort of alliteration or something with that. But yeah. here is here is what I'd like to do, because I, I want you to give a closer here. But for the next talk that we're going to do, I would like to um, and maybe maybe we talk about the uh, wreckage uh, completely first. And then uh, for our audience what we start to do is talk about solutions that we think with the, the, with the people out there trying to answer questions and trying to make a better America, a better world, what kind of input can a Dr. Schmuckler give that says, you know, this is something that we would like to add to your repertoire to help uh, solve this problem, these problems that we discuss here 
Uh, I always uh, like to have not only describing problems, but hopefully having solutions. So in for, in the last minute, why don't you give me a closer for this segment? Wow. Uh, I, I hope you feel okay about the way I'm going to do that because um, I, I feel like I've had two big ideas uh, in my life. One, one of them's got to do with that social evolutionary force that makes us into uh, broken rhesus monkeys in part. Uh, but the other one has to do with an understanding that at the center of the human battle is something that can be seen as a conflict between two coherent forces. There's a coherent force that consistently works to make things more broken. And there's a coherent force that consistently works to make things more whole. And I define good and evil in those terms. And then I try to show how there are these coherent forces. And it's got to do with that marbling that um, what we're engaged in is the battle between good and evil. And it turns out that there is a reality in the human world that is reasonable to describe that way, but you can get rid of those words if you don't like them, and you can say uh, a battle between a force of wholeness and a force of brokenness, and then I can show you how, how there are those coherent forces. And so I think that the what we should see is that basically the political situation in America today, and I know you're you are very devoted to that important dimension, as am I, that that political battle, and I've been trying to say this for 20 years, that we really should see it in terms of the battle between good and evil, not in some simple-minded way, but we. this is the nature of how what uh, politics has become in America. I grew up in a different kind of America. Then it was a, ma a matter of conservative versus liberal, and they would battle, and, and, and the elements of good and evil were sort of mixed in both both camps, and, and, they, and they, would, they, they would fight over things like tax rates and and various policy issues and uh, all kinds of things would enter into it in terms of values and principles. And neither side was just the good guy on every situation. Neither side was the bad guy on every situation. It was a mixture, but that's not what it is now. And, and even in the political realm, what we're dealing with is not just the political battle. We also, if we want to heal America, have to heal the nature of the consciousness that people that has been exploited by this force, that has taken uh, appeal to the worst of them, gotten them to believe the unbelievable, got and, them to defend the indefensible. And that is where we end it, Dr. Schmuckler. Uh, thank you so kindly once again. We've been listening to Dr. Andy Bard Schmuckler who writes a whole lot as well on these issues, and we are happy to have had you on Politics Done Right. Well, thank you for having me. Nice to be back. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.